All right. So I was asked to speak about addiction case severity. And uh, as an addiction specialist, you know, you want to be somebody who patients refer their sickest patients to. And so this is kind of the bread and butter of being an addiction specialist is to be able to handle the toughest cases. And so we're going to talk about some models to deal with these, these kind of difficult patients. So you might even think about this as like a pile of snakes, you know, that uh, need a way to handle all the, the things going on in the person's life. So I have no financial disclosures. Here's uh, the objectives of what I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna def define case severity. I'm gonna de describe how case severity impacts outcome. I'm gonna describe the module strategy to address case severity and describe how levels of care address case severity. And then we're gonna go over some sample cases. Uh, there'll be some discussion points and then I'll maybe uh, have some future directions to think about. And please, if you have any questions while I'm talking, feel free to chime in. You know, I think it's useful to get a good discussion going about these ideas. So Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, bad times have a scientific value. These are occasions a good learner would not miss. And so, you know, my attitude is to kind of welcome these toughest cases because, uh, you know, the severely ill patients, because it gives you an opportunity to learn how to manage them well and, and handle the, the most difficult situations. And when you're learning from a mentor, you want to know how did they handle their toughest cases. And then along the same lines, the African proverb, smooth seas don't make skilled sailors. So you want to have some rough seas to develop your, your sailing talent. So back when I worked at the VA hospital in 1997, uh, we used something called the Addiction Severity Index. So this goes back a long time in the field of addictions. And uh, it basically, it's a general overview of the substance use problem. And they divide the, these problems into seven functional areas that are shown to be effective by substance use. And so you've got the medical condition of the individual, their employment status, drug, and out, drug use and alcohol use, their legal status, and their family and social status and their psychiatric status. And so there's a, they, they actually had a computerized uh, program to do the addiction severity index scale on all the patients that were part of the methadone program or the substance use disorders program. And so Tom McClellan in 1998 did research on the ASI. And what he found is that patients who re-enter treatment programs often present with more severe addiction problems according to the ASI. And what he found is that they have difficulties that weren't addressed in their previous treatment episode. So things are being missed in the treatment of the patient that lead to relapse of addiction. And so a more severe ASI profile was found among those patients who came back to treatment compared to those who came for the first time. And so what we're learning basically from this is that the patients who relapsed and did the poorest had the greatest need. Now, Dave McDuff, who's a sports psychiatrist in Baltimore, he's the, the lead psychiatrist for the Orioles and the Colts also. He used to be the Ravens lead psychiatrist, but now he's the, the Colts lead psychiatrist. And uh, he's an addiction specialist. He developed this model of complex addiction. And I've, I've kind of expanded on his model, but I think it helps to think about what makes a case complex. And so we've got several items here. So multiple substances makes a case complex, and particularly when you have upper-downer pairing. So uh, if someone's using uppers, they may be self-medicating. If you think about the Kantian uh, theory that people self-medicate with substances, so if somebody's depressed, they may use uppers to feel better, or if someone's angry or they're anxious, they may use a downer to, to feel better. So why do people use upper-downer pairings? And so that's kind of a more complex case. And then risky routes of administration, like smoking and injecting. So it's the speed of onset of action of a substance that makes it most reinforcing. And so if you think about injecting or smoking, the, the speed that it gets to the brain and the in between the actual using and experiencing the, the intoxicating effects is very rapid. 
And so that makes it highly reinforcing. It makes it a more complex case. And then developing serious medical or psychiatric comorbidity or cognitive impairment uh, makes a case complex. Uh, and underemployment or low education can make things more difficult. Uh, concurrent dealing or criminality, uh, people having trauma issues uh, in the past or current trauma issues happening, and also grief and loss can make cases more complex. Uh, addiction during pregnancy can make it more complex, and multiple concurrent addiction types, so sex addiction, substances, food, gambling, shopping, uh, even internet uh, addiction or game video gaming addiction. And then complex social factors, so gang affiliation, uh, being associated with a marginalized group, uh, cultures associated with high addiction stigma, and family dysfunction and divorce, all these social aspects can uh, make cases more complex. And then languishing, so when a patient gets stuck in kind of a dysfunctional state, so relationships being stuck or work in school or poverty or homelessness, so that kind of stuck state, that languishing state makes a case more complex. And then early and late life addiction cases can be more complex. Uh, when I worked at, uh, blanking on the Annapolis rehab that I worked at, I, I can't think, Pathways it was called, there were people that were 13 or 14 years old that were involved in prostitution and all kinds of terrible behaviors related to addictions at that young of an age. And so that can make a case very complex for a young child. And then late life addiction cases often have uh, more severe medical problems and other cognitive issues that can be a factor in addiction cases. And then lastly, prominent individuals with a significantly developed career uh, can make cases complex. And so often they struggle with a lot of shame and their impairment affects a whole group of people because of the importance of what they're doing with their lives and their career. And so uh, th those prominent individuals with addiction can be very complex cases as well. So here's some information from uh, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health that points to complexity. And there's not, there's not a lot of literature about kind of the data of how common complexity is but I think you'll find in your clinical work that it's very common. And often it's not just one element that makes things complex, but multiple uh, domains are being affected. And so in 2014, 43.6 million Americans had some form of mental illness and 20.2 million had a substance use disorder in the last year. And of those 20.2 million, 11.3% had both an alcohol use disorder and an illicit drug use disorder. And 7.9 million had both a substance use disorder and a mental disorder. So all these comorbidities are super common. And then in 2012, 6% of pregnant women were using illicit drugs and 8.5% drank alcohol. So you've got a lot of substance use in pregnant women too. And so you can see that there, some of these uh, issues of complexity have some data supporting how common they are. And another way of looking at this is to look at what I call a general life review. And so you can divide life into 10 domains. And uh, if you look at a person, an addicted person's life in, 10, in these 10 domains, you can kind of see where the consequences of substance use are and just all the problems that they face. And so we're talking about physical health and mental health and recreation and leisure and marriage and family and social life and environment and housing and transportation and education, work finances and legal issues and their appearance and even their spiritual life can be effect, ill affected by substance use. And so you get, this is another model to kind of look at how severe this person's addiction is, you know, how, what's it impacting in their life. So let's talk about how you tackle case severity uh, using these models. And so the first thing I'm going to suggest is that work streams be modularized. And so what I mean by that is that you're going to have some recognition of the patterns in the person's life and then apply the best evidence to, to the evidence-based principles to the whole clinical situation and divide each problem into modules uh, where you can have the team break down these complex problems into the modules 
and then have patient, you know, have a whole strategy to deal with each individual module in the person's life. And also when you divide their kind of complex problems into modules, that reveals gaps in the addiction program. You know, maybe you're not meeting employment needs or legal issues, or you know, maybe there's some aspect of the patient's life that you kind of sweep under the rug that really kind of you know irritates their recovery and makes it difficult for them to, to improve their life. And so what you want to do is align the patient's needs and pain points with the right people. So that's the module approach. And so when you have the module approach, uh, Rusk and that group in 2018 said, if you just change a single module, that may fail to tip the system into a new stable state and relapse can occur. And so changes within multiple, mo multiple modules can have a synergistic reinforcement effect. And that helps to tip the system into a stable pattern. And so if you have unchanged parts of the system, that can undermine the attempt to change leading to relapse. And sometimes changes in one module can spill over into the others. And you kind of get an interaction between domains that helps to tip the system into stability. And especially when you have potent changes in the system that are a good fit for the individual, that's when it promotes useful changes in an upward spiral. So here's a diagram of what I'm talking about. And so if in A, you have all the five areas that, of functioning that can be improved and you change one module or one domain. And so that tips that, that you, know, you see that ball moving in B, but in C, you get relapsed because it hasn't stabilized. But in D, you have multiple domain interventions. And so you tip the scale and in F, you have stabilization because you've tipped the system with enough modules changing. So that's the module approach. And then also you can tackle severity of illness with the ASAM levels of care. So we were talking about that with the case just a minute ago. So you wanna select the appropriate level of care uh, for the individual situation. And ASAM guides us you know, about how to select the right level of care. But you've got these different levels of care, early intervention, low intensity outpatient, intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization, inpatient rehab, medically managed inpatient. And so, you know, somebody has, somebody's an alcoholic and they've had DTs or seizures, they're gonna be required to be in a medically managed inpatient unit where it's safe for them to be detoxed off the alcohol uh, without having a, a serious medical outcome. And, uh, you know, if, uh, for example, with this case that we talked about, so maybe inpatient rehab is appropriate for somebody who just can't seem to, to get any kind of sobriety time in an outpatient setting. And so you wanna think about what's the appropriate level of care for the person. And the basic premise to this is, if the patient is failing the current level of care, intensify the treatment. So you don't wanna kick them out of treatment if they're failing a level of care. You wanna offer them more treatment. And that does a couple things. So first of all, the patient has to make more time commitment to the treatment because it's a higher level of care. And so that's an incentive alone for them to wanna to be sober so they don't have to commit so much time to treatment. But also you're giving them more treatment. And so the additional treatment is also gonna work in their favor to get this severe addiction under control. I hope that makes sense to everybody. All right, so I'm gonna go over some case examples. And these cases are not actual cases. Yeah, I've been practicing for about 27 years, so I've seen a lot of kind of different scenarios. And so these are kind of drummed up cases that represent the sort of things that I've seen over the course of my career. So here's an example. 29-year-old male with a history of severe opiate use disorder, cocaine use disorder, and alcohol use disorder, uh, an unspecified depressive disorder, has been treated for two years with Suboxone, Antabuse, and Celexa. He's very intelligent and enjoys reading the Harvard Business Review. He's supported himself for years by dealing drugs in the local community and has faced some incarcerations for possession and distribution. He had a long-term relationship with a beautiful young lady who left him because of his persistent languishing state of little to no growth, of not going anywhere. And he remained fixated on this woman. He never worked other than some infrequent solo music gigs. 
Eventually, after years of treatment in which he was stable psychiatrically, he relapsed cocaine and alcohol use. He failed intensive outpatient level of care, antabuse and camporal. He was sent to inpatient rehab and following his discharge, relapsed again and then refused to go back to the rehab and was eventually administratively detoxed off Suboxone. His addictions therapist saw him as entitled and resistant to change. And he revealed that his guilt, uh, he revealed his guilt and that maybe he was sabotaging himself as a way of punishing himself for his past misdeeds. And in particular, he was feeling guilty for introducing his best friend to drugs who was living a terrible life in and out of jail. So what do you guys think? Why is this case severe or complex? And what are the aspects of it that make it complex or severe? Any ideas? Dr. Herschler, I'll uh, monitor the chat for you if anything comes in. Okay. He has multiple substance abuse. Yeah, and also upper downer pairing. So he's using cocaine and alcohol and opiates. So you've got downers and uppers there, right? So this is a, the, the substance choice is a, is a severe issue, right? What else? languishing yeah so he's stuck he, he was fixated on this lady but she was unhappy with him because he's dealing drugs and not going anywhere with his life and you know she she had hopes for somebody who was maybe more mainstream successful in their life so he's kind of stuck in this persistent dysfunctional state what else he's got a crappy job dealing drugs yeah so criminal behavior and dealing drugs so that's Later. another issue that makes it complex. Yeah, relationship issues. Mm -hmm. Complex. And right. he's already failed outpatient. Yeah, so he, he failed all the levels of outpatient and he failed inpatient and then didn't want to go back to inpatient. So yeah, this, this guy's really stuck. So uh, multiple substances, up or down repairing, dealing language and criminal history. Oh, and psychiatric comorbidity, right? So he had, he had an unspecified depressive disorder. So how do we handle this guy? So what about the modules approach? What are his modules? The matrix. Well, he, he, I couldn't hear what you said, Jamal. Say it again. The matrix module, they have to be involved more than issue. The medication, the motivational interview, the individual counseling. Right, so that's how you address the addiction issue. So of course he needs therapy and uh, he needs medication, which uh, those things have been attempted. But so maybe some of these other needs that he has, if you think about McClellan's research on the ASI, so maybe some of these other needs that he has need to be addressed. So one thing is he's lonely maybe. He was fixated on this woman and he has no partner. And so maybe something needs to be done to address it. You know, find new places to connect and maybe uh, abstinence would be support you know, if he could develop a life of abstinence maybe that would improve his, his chances of developing a meaningful relationship with somebody right and then these legal issues so he has a criminal history that can make it hard to get a job right so so in in morgantown we have something called appellation reintegrate which is a program that helps people with legal issues and substance use disorders get a job and, and start working and getting back to work. So, you know, maybe he needs some supported employment uh, to get his, his work situation improved. Do you see how meeting these module needs might help assist him in his recovery? Yeah, but it Inside our programs, how do we actually go about, because many of our patients face similar issues. And in terms of case management, yeah, we can help some of the social in terms of getting IDs, referring to DHHR. But a lot of times when it comes to the legal, I'm not sure what to do. I mean, we can write supportive letters to get some things expunged from their history. But pretty much in Charleston, there's just one or two places that would take people who suffer from substance use disorders with a criminal background. And I, and I don't know of our other resources. 
So that that's going to require some advocacy on the on the behalf of the addictions uh, field, you know, to say, look, you know, if we're going to help these people improve their lives, we have to open some doors for them. Yeah. Interesting. So I found out one of our client patients told me if they apply through an employment agency, there it's easier to get employed even if it's at the same job. So just something to consider for them doing through employment agencies. I don't know why that is, but you know, they may end up in the same job, but um, we've had some people be able to get employed even despite that having some felonies. All right, so let's, let, that's good. So let's look at the next case. So this case is a 38 year old male with no prior psychiatric history who presented with depression and suicide thoughts with plans for suicide in the context of cocaine use, which he smokes. And he feels unsafe and predicts that he will end his life if he doesn't get help. He is a bit childlike in character. His father left the family when he was young. He has an estranged relationship with his stepbrother due to incest. He has never had a depressive episode in the absence of drug use. During his hospitalization, he also reported sex acts with dogs, which is distressing to him. He refused to further discuss his behavior during his hospitalization. His, his use of cocaine is out of control. It has caused consequences in several domains of life. He's experienced tolerance to the drug and withdrawal symptoms. So what do you guys think about this case? What makes it severe or complex? The substance in use. Yeah, well, it, right. So he, he's got a psychiatric issue here that makes the case more complex. And it does seem to be substance related because it doesn't happen in the absence of substance use. And it's very severe. So he's suicidal and needed to be hospitalized. So the level of care is inpatient psychiatric unit because he's suicidal, right? So you have to meet the needs of the patient with levels of care, right? And you got to wonder whether he's got some PTSD, you know, under all this or trauma history, it sounds like on top of that. Mm -hmm. I guess we don't know from the story, but it, it sounds like that kind of a scenario, right? You know, another psychiatric issue kind of borders on addiction for him. You know, sex acts with dogs is a, considered a paraphilia, but in some ways it's like an addiction behavior, a sex addiction. And, uh, you know, perhaps this guy is using cocaine and then having sexual relations with animals you know, as part of a cocaine high. And so it, it's all an addictive behavior process. So that can be a complex addiction in that way, you know, that uh, you've got multiple kind of addiction types going on. Anything else you can think of that makes it complex? He's smoking the cocaine, right? So it's a, a rapid onset of action. So you got to, you know, that, that effect also. Let's see what my notes say here. All right, so multiple addiction types, risky routes of administration, languishing, uh, psychiatric comorbidity, complex social factors, and loss. Yeah, his he's estranged from his father. His father left uh, when he was young. So what do you think about the module's approach to this guy? Well, I'll offer some ideas. So part of this is this sexual history is troubling him. And so maybe a more appropriate setting would be for him to develop relationships with people instead of animals. And so you could facilitate that maybe with gay AA or NA meetings, which they, they have that sort of thing in Baltimore. So uh, you know, maybe that would be something that he could be involved in. And, uh, and psychotherapy, of course, and medication, there's pharmacologic treatments of paraphilias. So addressing the psychiatric issues, uh, you know, outside of the depression, which is going to resolve when he's off the cocaine. Other thoughts? Do you think a guy like this belongs in the hospital who's you on a cocaine crash and suicidal? I yeah. see Michael shaking his head. 
Yeah, he would benefit from inpatient stabilization. And then even from there, he could be connected to probably inpatient rehab afterwards. And he might even be a good person to consider sober living for. Yeah, so it's an interesting case. All right, here's another case. 35-year-old female with a history of PTSD, opiate, and alcohol use disorders who was injured in a motor vehicle collision and had several serious fractures requiring surgery. She was started on sub suboxone for pain and her opiate use disorder titrated to 12 milligrams, three milligrams, total dose per day divided into four milligrams, one milligram TID with a partial analgesic response. She is in physical therapy to improve her range of motion. She has intrusive memories of the accident, but no longer has nightmares of it. She denies being under the influence at the time of the accident and there was no DUI charge. She's taking Zoloft 50 milligrams a day for PTSD. She's able to drive. She doesn't startle as much as she did following the accident. And she now has a softer vigilance. She has degrees in marketing and communication, but works as a waitress. She resumed work at a restaurant, but her environment is filled with substance users, including coworkers and at the bar in the restaurant. She socializes with coworkers and drinks alcohol heavily at times. She was started on camphor and abuse after a period of abstinence from alcohol while in the hospital, but she became non-compliant with both of them after her discharge. She lives alone and there's no one available to a supervisor taking the abuse to guarantee compliance with it. She has been abstinent from opiates with a current treatment with Suboxone. She was raised in a religious family and they have banished her from the family because of her substance use and in their view, more immoral lifestyle. The family problems and underemployment are her only perceived consequences of substance use. So what do you guys think about this case? What makes it severe and complex? She has comorbid um, PT PTSD. She has an unstable and work environment. She's lost her religious support in terms of her, her family. Her med she's under-medicated <laughs> for PTSD. Um, and she also probably has chronic pain. Yeah, so she has pain. She has uh, undertreated pain and undertreated PTSD. And uh, her environment is a terrible recovery environment. She's working in a, she's underemployed. She's working in a restaurant, but she has a marketing and communications degree. Uh, so she's kind of underemployed. I think we got most of it. Yeah, this is a the social situation is terrible with her family. You know, being the stigma kind of alienating her from her family. That's a tough thing for a, a patient. What were you gonna say, Jamal? What's that? What's that, John? I thought you were gonna say something. No, no, no. I agree with whatever. I'm just. I think Tanya, Tanya, did you have a comment? I saw you. Have yeah, I was just going to comment on the fact that um, she's socially isolated, even though she's out drinking alcohol with coworkers. Um, she's isolated from people who um, care about her, and she doesn't have that sense that of self worth. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's a perfect for for foray into uh, the modules approach. So what are her modules and how can we address her needs in a treatment plan? Better treatment for PTSD, better treatment for her chronic pain. Yeah, all right, so the medical issues, yep, the, the pain and the, and the PTSD. Maybe get in some EMDR as well for the psychotherapy and connect her with a, su a support community. Mm -hmm. So if she needs social group reconstruction badly, right? She's at the, her employment is a terrible environment. So we need to get her in an environment where it's going to be supportive for her. And maybe for somebody with her background, that's a religious environment, you know, that maybe a spiritual practice or something would be for, good for her to get back into. That's what I was going to say. I could see Celebrate Recovery being a huge support from her because while well, she's been, as you said, stigmatized, shamed by her religious family, to get that religious support from that community is probably really helpful. All right, so let me see what I have here. So why is this case complex? Multiple substances, so she's using alcohol and opiates. 
medical comorbidity, psychiatric comorbidity, underemployed in complex social situations. So what about her level of care? Does she require rehab or uh, inpatient, medically managed inpatient, or can this be managed as an outpatient? Or what do you guys think? How much was she drinking? You maybe said that and I missed it. She's a binge, binge drinker. So she drinks heavily with friends, but it's not like every day. She can have intensive outpatients. Yes, yeah, so that'd be a good level of care for her, right? All right, so discussion points. So the ability to read the complexity and severity of difficult problems is an invaluable component of excellent care. And so basically what you're doing is clarifying the needs of the patient. So we get, we get so focused medically in a medical model about the the diagnosis and uh, treat the appropriate treatment for a diagnosis, that's just not adequate for a severely ill patient. You know, that I think you have to think about what is the, what is the, the needs that this person is facing and how can we address these needs? And perhaps the best way to do that is to modularize the work streams. And then of course, choose the appropriate level of care. And if the patient is failing the current level of care, intensify the treatment. So what about future directions? So what I, what, what I would argue is that if we can modularize the work streams and create levels of care within each module, that would be the best way to address the needs. And so you know, maybe we could have levels of care for work or levels of care for relationships, not just levels of care for health. Or all those, if you think about that general life review, all the legal issues, you know, what's the appropriate level of care for that person's needs? or uh, you know, say, kind of thinking about the whole clinical situation. And so what you really want to develop is a complete solution. You know, how do we get a complete solution for this patient's presentation? So here's my references. Any thoughts about this kind of approach to severe cases? I really like that approach. I know for me, I can get overwhelmed when they're so complex and it's hard to not, you know, they're just thinking of multiple ones at one time. And I, I really like the way this sort of separates things out for me in my brain, if that makes sense. And if you work with a team, you know, you can have different talents within the team to focus on the different modules and address them by people who are specialized in a different area that someone's struggling with. And so we even reach outside of WVU, like Appalachian re uh, Reintegrate is not part of WVU as far as I know. It's a separate, you know, a separate organization that's addressing employment needs of patients. Or Sober Living, for example, is not part of uh, WVU, but it's a, it addresses the, the housing issues that come up and good recovery environments that come up for patients. And so you, you wanna develop a system that can meet the needs of these patients so that they get, so that they they stabilize, you know, that they, all those modules get addressed and they stabilize in a new kind of recovering state. Are there structural barriers to the team approach in terms of referrals and you know getting the patient everything he or she needs? Uh, that's a good question. I, you know, so for example, here at WVU, we do have an issue with therapy, you know, that the, sometimes patients have to wait a while to get a therapist. And so it's not, you know, uh, treatment on demand, unfortunately, for some issues. And so that, that's a barrier. But uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. And obviously, those barriers need to be addressed. Thank you for talking about this topic. What I, one thing I really liked about it is how it put um, it can help us help our fo our patients focus on things other than just not using right because if we talk about hey you know what we can get you in, get you in touch with someone to help with the legal or let's get you getting your ID or let's get an employment on the way they can start to see um, their recovery as a whole and not just siloed into the into medications. Yeah, so the medical model is kind of incomplete for what the patient is facing.
Dina, did your have did your kiddo have any maybe thoughts or feedback on that on the module way of looking at things? Yeah, he said he loved what Jeremy was saying, and mommy is pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fisher. No, you're welcome. This has been so wonderful. And we're getting a lot of great chats and too, thanking you for the presentation. Um, uh, and Dr. Long mentioned, it sounds great. We have limited resources available. Absolutely. So it's a way to grow, right? This, is the, this seems to be an area of growth that would be important to meet the needs of the patients. You know, with any final comments, questions, or thoughts, you know, about five minutes left. So Dr. Long says, I agree. Um, how do you suggest we do that? <laughs> so maybe it, it means contacting the, the, the powerful voices in your department, you know, who are the, who are the people who can influence the community and kind of say, hey, this is what science tells us, going all the way back to, you know, that was 2000, I think, when uh, McClellan, I forget what year that, or 1997, I can't remember what year that was, that 98, I think, is his research was. So it goes back pretty far, kind of in the, the foundation of addictions work. So it, it's well-established stuff that we should be doing. And a couple of folks also mentioned uh, Jobs and Hope being a great resource, um, especially in the beginning. Thank you, Tanya and Sarah, for adding that. So Tanya mentioned for housing, I would look to your uh, COC programs. There are four that uh, covers the whole state. We also util utilize legal aid. Thank you for adding that. And feel free to unmute if you want to elaborate or anything. You know, this is um, Jennifer Boyd. It occurs to me that it's one reason I'm pretty excited that our team is connected to the, um, the treatment court system in our county because it, it offers um, an added um, uh, support, really support for those people who are involved in the legal system. Um, it just sort of augments what um, what what we can be doing, um, and that that team I've never heard the, them use the word modules, but that treatment team in the courts is clearly looking at least in, here in Fayette County they're looking at at the whole person, um, which is which is you know inspiring to see and addressing different facets of that person's life. Yeah, I think it's exciting to think about what the potential to, ch to transform somebody's life really is with a complete solution. You know, I like the idea of a complete solution. So maybe not just a partial solution, but a, a, a complete solution for the individual. These are all great comments and thoughts. Thank you all so much. Well, if there are no further questions or uh, discussion or anything, um, thank you so much, Dr. Herschler. That was a really wonderful presentation. Um, as usual, I'll be attaching the slides to the recap email, so you all will have a copy of those. Um, and thank you, Jen, as well, for your case. Uh, it was really wonderful and drove a lot of great discussion, so uh, we appreciate that. The only announcement I have is that our next session will be on March 28th, and Dr. Aljari will be presenting on deck Dextroamphetamine, uh, is it the buprenorphine for stimulant use disorder? I apologize if I'm not pronouncing any, any of that correctly, but I'll type it all out in the recap email as well. So thank you all so much. We'll see you next time. Thank Take you. Take care.